Manhattan that we'll get into later involving the fact that there is no money after 1933 and HGR 192 went into existence. There is no money today, so therefore you can pay anything with a promise to pay. If you send somebody a check, that's a promise to pay. The assumption is, is that it comes from your bank account and you had to labor and give something of substance, which is your labor, which has a real value in exchange for those Federal Reserve notes, which have no value. However, a promise to pay can also be in the form of just your signature on a piece of paper saying, I promise to pay you. And they both have the same validity. So a proof for value is that I accept that I owe you money and here's my promise to pay you. When am I going to pay you? Well, sometime in the future, but you can't hold me to it any more than I can hold you to it. In other words, you gave me a check for working for you and I deposited it in the bank and I got Federal Reserve notes. When am I going to get paid? Never, right? I'm never going to get paid. I accept that as payment until I don't accept it, you see? If I don't complain about it, then I've accepted it. And this is the whole process we're talking about here today, the whole concept. So I'm going to show you another instance of what goes on when you send off your um, conditional acceptance letter, which I like to call self-executing contracts. So this would be the last line in it. Failure to rebut each and every point in this self-executed contracting common law and my attached affidavit, affidavit of Jane Doe, see I've named it, within 30 calendar days, so I've named a time frame, after receipt thereof. And how can I prove receipt thereof? Because I have certified mail that shows that they received it, and I have a proof of service showing that somebody stuffed the documents in the letter or manila envelope that got sent off. With factual, verified, certified evidence sworn to in the form of a notarized affidavit. In other words, if you're not going to swear to it in the form of an affidavit, then, it's, then I don't have to accept it because I put an affidavit in the record and signed with a wet ink signature by a flesh and blood woman under their full commercial liability. So I'm telling you, I'm going to sue you if you're committing fraud. Will be tacit admission and silent acquiescence to the truth of the statements made within these presented documents. Failure to provide a notarized affidavit as noted above within 30 calendar days after receipt thereof will cause the IRS, which is who, was happen who I was happening to send this letter to, to be barred and stopped from taking any legal action against Jane Doe for any reason. And then, quote, silence can only be equated with fraud where there is a legal or moral duty to speak or where an inquiry left unanswered would be intentionally misleading. United States versus Tweel, 550 F. 2nd, 297. This is a court case from 1977. And in fact, this court case was an IRS court case. And then you're going to date it and sign it without prejudice by your signature and authorized representative underneath it. Now, if you were on the other end of the line and your attorney took a look at this, would he know that you mean business? You're serious. You're not leaving anything unsaid. You're accusing and failure to respond is going to have consequences. Nobody's going to read that and go, ugh, I can ignore this. They're going to know that you mean business. So when they do ignore it and fail to respond, how do you put the clamp on? How do you finalize this process? How do you get more? You have to give somebody three chances, right? The rule of three. You have to give them three chances, and if they fail to respond three times, they're guilty. So this is the first letter. You're going to give them 30 days to respond. 21 days would be the minimum. You can give somebody five days to respond if it's something, just an answer to a question. But if you're asking for documentation, if you're asking for somebody to look up records and provide records or certified copies of records for you, you have to give them a minimum of 21 days. 30 days is reasonable. I mean, if you got something, you'd like to have 30 days to respond to it. And, you know, that's fair. 
So give them 30 days to respond. And when they fail to respond, you're going to go online on, on track and confirm and look up and print off the fact of when they got it. And then 30 days after, 30 calendar days after the time they got it, you're going to give it an extra day and you're going to send off a notice of default and opportunity to cure. And in your notice of default and opportunity to cure, give them another seven days to respond. Just say, you are now in default and you failed to answer, but I'm going to give you seven more days to answer. At, you're going to send that off with a proof of service and certified mail. When they refuse to answer that, you're going to send them a second, a third notice that's going to say, notice of default and notice of estoppel. And in your notice of estoppel, estoppel is a common law action that says you can no longer move forward. This, this matter is settled. You've lost the right to respond. And administratively, you've gone into agreement, right? So you've lost the right to respond. Now they have three notices. And they, if, they, if they don't respond to the first one, the second one, and the third one, they have you know, not, nobody to cry on their shoulder about it. It's done. It's a done deal. Three notices. That's how you get them. But you have to be able to document it. You have to be able to do it by the book. And you have to do it in such a way that there is no coming back for them. They do this to you all the time, and you once you understand what's going on, it's easy to see it. The credit card company will send you a letter saying that if you don't respond to this presentment, they won't call it a presentment, if you don't respond to this letter within 30 days, you will have agreed to the debt. Well, if you, don't, if you throw that letter in the garbage, then you have agreed to the debt by Neil Dissett, failure to speak. So, you don't want to fail to speak, you want to object. Why don't you just send them a letter back saying, I owe you zero dollars. You've just objected. And they, and the ball's back in their court, and they have to justify that you don't owe them zero dollars. Pretty. So you could say, I conditionally accept that I owe you whatever the amount is, based upon your proof of claim that that's true, and that you would suffer a loss if I failed to pay you any more money. So you've put the ball back in their court, and now they have to come back and prove to you. And what they'll often do is they'll send you a stack of statements showing that you spent money. What they're not telling you is that you sent a promissory note to them when you first took out the application for the contract. You signed a unilateral contract wherein you put your signature on a contract that said you're applying for a credit card application for $10,000 maximum or something like that. They take your credit card application for $10,000, which has your name and your promise to pay, an amount, the $10,000, who's going to get the money, the credit card company, Chase Manhattan, and the date, because you've dated it, and that's a check. They deposit that check in their bank account, and now they have $10,000 to which to draw off of, and which is fine if you agree to it and you don't know what's going on. And, you know, our whole civilization would come to an end if everybody caught on to the fraud that's going on. Because if nobody had to pay for anything and all you had to do was sign your name to something to pay for it, who would go to work? We'd all, you know, I mean, the whole country would fall apart. Nobody would go to work because we could just sign for everything. Hey, we need groceries, let's sign our name to it. We need a new car, let's sign our name to it. But the fact is, is that the guys on Wall Street know about this and why do you think there's trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars floating around and somebody's just really really rich and the banks like in 1929 are coming along and taking everybody's homes even though they haven't lost a dime on loaning you money and if you don't believe me the test comes when you send them a letter to verify it and once they start dancing around the issue and not answer your questions, you will understand that what I'm saying is true.
And those that are in power are getting afraid of what's happening. Because once the sleeping giant awakens, once the people start discovering what's really going on, they're going to get upset about it. Why shouldn't we? I mean, you got people that are working two and three jobs